the things that you do face, you're, you're incredible about. I mean, who could face surgery, hospitalization, suffering, God knows what in the way you do? I mean, I couldn't look at it, Joe. Sure you could, honey. No. I no, couldn't. I know how you feel because, as I said to Marsden today, after my, not excluding my two hip operations, which were nothing, but after my first cancer operation, I met a woman in the hospital who had six, and I saw six operations. I'd never go through that. I mean, it's just the thought of it was beyond my ken. Now that I've been through six, I think so seven, you know. When Joan and Eric Robinson married, her cancer had already been diagnosed. They enjoyed their lives together, even though it wasn't quite a honeymoon. Ouch! What's the matter? I get a funny pain in there. Illness tests all relationships. Okay. Yeah. The bonds between husband and wife, parent and child, friends and lovers are strained. We're often desperate for a grasp of what's happening to us. I do my best with this situation, but I just do not want to live minute in and minute out cancer and whenever I pick up a book to start reading about cancer as well, you know what I mean? There's a limit to this. We watch every film on cancer there is on television. We sit here making a film about cancer, right? We continually in and out of hospitals about cancer. You know, I, no, I mean, I understand your concern about it, and I'm concerned about it, but I do not want my life to be swamped by cancer. Tomorrow I may die of heart disease myself. I'm just, you know, praying, saying, me, where do I come into this? In Ecclesiastes, we read, Woe to him who falleth alone. If we're lucky, long-term illness is not a solitary experience. But the effects of the illness do radiate outward with an emotional and psychological impact upon those who are close and dear. I'm Meryl Streep. Prolonged illness creates stresses which affect the sick and the well. The tests are demanding. Joan and Eric Robinson whom we meet in this film, are a couple who went through those trials. Their scenes were filmed as they actually occurred, and they show what may arise in any personal relationship subject to unrelenting illness. Some of the scenes were filmed in black and white. Some of them show people smoking. That's how it happened. The Robinsons agreed to have private moments filmed because they wanted to help other people. To illuminate the issues raised by the stress of illness, we turn to a number of authorities. I think the family should... Dr. Alvin Poussaint, uh, associate professor uh, of psychiatry at Harvard uh, Medical School and associate and in psychiatry at the Judge Baker Guidance Center in Boston. Would have been many different ways. Community is probably the most... The Reverend Julius Sibley, Episcopal One priest, aspect. chaplain at several large New York City hospitals. Facing serious, serious illness. Self-help groups bring together people... Frank Reisman, co-founder of the National Self-Help Clearinghouse, uh, professor of social psychology at Queens College, City University of New York, and editor of Social Policy. We're social animals. Our joys, even our sorrows, mean more when we can share them. We are, in a sense, a record of whom we have loved and those who have loved us. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Joan. Happy birthday to you. Thank you, dear. Long-term illness need not be a dreary desert, lacking joy. <laughs> Happy birthday, Happy darling. Birthday, Joan. Happy birthday, Joan. Thank you. Laughter during illness is often the test of a relationship, and so is the ability to cry. Before they were married, Joan told Eric she had cancer. He tells how he felt. Joan was coming to have dinner with me in my apartment and we were going out to a film. And uh, just as we were getting towards the end of dinner, Joan said to me, what time does a film end? 
so I didn't think very much about it, and I rang up and found out, and then I said, well, it's only, it's finishing at half past nine or something, and then I thought, well, that's a strange question to ask. So I said, why do you want to know? She said, oh, well, I've got something to tell you. So I said, well, why don't you tell me now? So she wouldn't tell me. So I thought, oh, well, it's bad news. So I said, I'm not going to a film. I can't go and enjoy a film having some bad news hanging over me. So I said, all right, let's go out. She told me that she was seriously ill from cancer and dying of cancer. So as far as I remember, I treated it all in a very matter-of-fact kind of way at the time, a very level-headed, textbookish kind of control. I went back home, I went to bed, I slept excellently, I woke at about half past seven the next morning, and I went into the bathroom, and I wept for an hour. And I would be hard put to it to say whether I was sorrier for Joan or for me. The person caring for the seriously uh, ill person has to face the full range of the emotions that they're going to have. I think, one, they, they're going to feel sometimes some guilt, as I mentioned uh, earlier, that is, it, is there something they could have done to have prevented uh, the illness? At times, they're going to feel tension inside about uh, their own mortality, the fear of death. I think they're also, at times, particularly if they have no help, they may feel some feelings of resentment at having to care for the person. Eric, yes. the drugstore didn't deliver anything. Good one. The drugstore didn't deliver. Well, not that while I'm. Doctor didn't deliver my elephant. Didn't call them to, and I have no elephant. None. Well, what do you need it for? Is it so bad? It's my antidepressant. I take it three times a day. Well, you have to be depressed, dear. We can't get it now. Which I do. Well, you know, we shouldn't be reduced to that situation. I agree with you, but it's hard sometimes to don't remember shout, everything. Don't shout. Don't shout. Well, Eric, uh, can't you understand that sometimes no. with all these fucking pills that I might get low Look, something? I'm not listening to this dramatic representation now. If you want to call Master and ask him to put in a, a prescription, call oh, Master. What right? if I call a druggist at home? Strains mount. Overburdened relatives of the patient often feel anger and deprivation. In a case of a husband and wife, a wife who, who was doing a lot of things around the house or caring for the family, that the husband will feel a loss and feel uh, a little bit of resentment about that. I think in those cases that the, the husband or the, uh, has to accept the grief that goes with that loss, that he's going to feel sad, he's going to feel some, uh, some depression, he's going to feel some guilt, a little bit of resentment. But that's a normal uh, human uh, response. I think it's important for uh, the husband, say in this case, to, to face those feelings squarely, uh, not to deny them, not to be too stoical, and to talk about them with uh, friends and, if necessary, a counselor. Sometimes when she's gone into hospital, I've heaved a sigh of relief. Mm -hmm. Not for a day or so. I've said, thank God, it's not my responsibility for a few hours. Right? I'm not dealing with it. Jody's there, or Trish is there, or, mm -hmm. and there's a whole staff of doctors, and Christ knows what, and everything's laid on, and everything's available. And, you know, and it isn't me. Um, so I know that I know enough about myself to know that I shall have to overcome a good deal of, of, of feeling, you know, because I know it's there on occasion. I recognize it. I mean, I'm not going to say that I'm going to give way to it, but I know that it, it will be something that will occur to me. Eventually, Eric felt he had to get away on vacation. But leaving was not easy. Before he could go, he had to fight Joan's cousin, who had come to help care for her. I said, the whole point of my holiday was that I had aging parents too, uh, that I had not seen for two years. She would observe that she was at least in a position to see her mother as frequently as she chose to pretty well, that I hadn't seen mine for two years, and my mother was sick also and I wanted to get out and see them. And besides that, I wanted to see the rest of my family. I wanted to see my country. I wanted to have a break, and I didn't want to just...
detour for a few days and back again because that wasn't going to do me any good. But for the patient, there is no vacation from chronic illness. The ill person must also find release for surging feeling. The sick person, yes, has a lot of emotions of uh, depression, frustration, uh, and rage that comes with a, a very serious illness. Uh, I think that they're going to have to express a lot of those feelings uh, to help uh, get rid of some of them. That is, they're going to have to recognize that they're angry. They're going to have to let themselves feel angry a bit. I'm not lucky, okay? I'd be lucky if I didn't have cancer. Mm -hmm. And it's true that for a person with cancer, if you want to put a lot of qualifiers on it, then you could say I'm lucky, okay? But in other words, you don't think that you're lucky to have a husband that's changed and bent himself to, into new sort of roles and shit. Oh, I know it takes it. <laughs> yeah, but, but what, at what price? They're going to have to let themselves experience some of the depression because I believe that letting out these emotions are better than keeping them inside, that they're more likely to disappear and a person move to a new stage of <laughs> at least some acceptance of the reality of the illness. Sometimes when someone's dying in a family, the whole family becomes depressed. People don't know what to say to their friend. They don't know what to talk about. So instead of really reaching out and becoming involved in the situation, sometimes it's easier to, to pull back. That was my Aunt Helen who was just visiting last week. First time since I've had cancer. Uh, she really? Lives, well, she has a big family and she lives in Hastings and she's grandchildren. Where's Hastings? It's outside of New York. But you know what she just said to me on the phone? She said, well, you have more courage than I have. And she said, I think the reason I haven't come before is that I was afraid I couldn't face it. Yeah, that's what I felt. She said that. She Did said she? she was a coward. She didn't say why she was a coward, but that's what I gathered. I think she was too cowardly to come before. Poor thing. Families need to know and understand what the person is experiencing who's seriously ill. They have to face up to, to the condition, too, that they can't uh, run from them or, or shut the person off. And you called me and you came right over. And I thought that was brave of you, actually. Because I think it's hard to face people with cancer. Mm -hmm. At least it had been for me in my first experience, because I yeah. didn't know what to say to them. I think a family and a patient dealing with long-term illness should look for no, support. Some of the best support is coming from self-help groups. That is, people who share a common disease, uh, women who share a mastectomy as a result of, of breast cancer, people who have colostomies, uh, because they know best what their needs are and what their feelings are, and they can help each other uh, in the best possible way and not feel a sense of isolation and aloneness. The essence of a self-help group is a small group of people who have the same problem, and have experienced that problem, have experienced ways of dealing with that problem, helping each other to deal with it more effectively. There's a self-help group for every problem or illness that exists. There's a self-help group for diabetics, there's self-help groups for arthritics, for people with high blood pressure, for people with cancer, people with heart disorder, people with strokes. Human support, social support from other people is critical to life. There are now a whole series of studies which demonstrate convincingly that having the support of other people is critical for not getting a disease or when one has a disease, surviving better with it, living longer, or getting over it. Every one of the people in this party have been people that have been in and out of the house during the year. I mean, it's not just an occasion where a lot of people have been hauled together. Either I've been visiting them or they've been visiting us. They're a group of friends that really are friends. I can go round the whole group of people and I know that every one of the people at the party at the moment has been part of our life during the last year. I mean as well as of course in many cases being part of either Jones or my life for a longer time. Hi Isabel. Hi. Family and, and, and friends play a major role in, in helping the, the ill person still feel a part of, of, of the family uh, and the community. They shouldn't get into a position where they are determined to treat the person as if they're very sick and they're ill. They have to encourage their independence as much as possible at the same time that they give them the emotional support. Churches can help a person who is seriously ill, coping with serious illness, 
by letting them know that they're not alone, by letting them know that they're with them, that there is a community supporting them, that there are people out there who really care. And uh, they care not for uh, reasons of professionalism, but because they care through, through their hearts. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, of which thy bounty we are about to receive. Amen. Fine. That, that sound good enough? Okay. I would advise a friend who is a friend of a seriously ill person to try to deal with that person as much in the same way as they did before. To listen to them, to listen to new concerns around the illness and the sickness, but also to do all of those things and talk about those types of things that they always did. If they engaged in certain activities together, whether playing cards, going places, they should continue those types of activities. When, when did you have that operation? The, the last operation, yeah. I had it um, three weeks ago today, a week before Christmas. Does this have an, uh, a surprise for you? I mean, uh, an yes, they found a lump in my breast. And uh, first, they did, first they had a surgery to remove the lump only. And then they found that it was a different cancer, a brand new one. You know what I mean? Like, not... A different kind of thing, Yeah. Uh, I have two kinds now. You're quite unique. Not enough to be one, I've had two. Support for the ill comes from many sources. Family, friends, social institutions. But finally, we must take responsibility for ourselves. Self-pity must be fought. Sources of pride and self-esteem must be found. It was getting a bit long, wasn't it? A bit mm -hmm. thick. Yeah. But I told him I could cut it as short as time. No, I think he's done it just about nicely. Yeah. It's good. Here she comes, Miss America. Many people, as they try to organize themselves, find psychotherapy helpful. How do you feel about the guilt for your sins of omission, commission, whatever? I guess I do feel that in the eyes of the church as I knew it, even though it may have changed, that I am a sinful person. And, um, and 20 priests can come and tell me it's okay, but I don't think I'll believe them. <laughs> or Monsignors, or the Pope, you know. I'm still going to say, yeah, but when I was 12, they told me. So it's really developed your perspective yourself on those deeds and acts. Yeah, and it's very easy to have perspective when you're feeling okay. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not easy when you think, oh, I'm going to die soon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what's going to happen then? Sometimes people who get a serious illness and sometimes people are in a serious uh, accident uh, feel guilty. They, they look for ways of explaining it. And if they're oriented toward good and evil and if they're religious, that sometimes they may feel that they, this has befallen them because of some transgression that they committed. And now they're getting uh, retribution from, from somewhere, uh, from God, from the devil, but from somewhere. I have a number of books on religion on the bedside table. And the reason I have those books is that I thought, well, maybe if I read enough, I can find the answer. I better cover all the bases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pascal said that if you're not sure, it's better to opt for the sign of believing just in case. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. During serious illness, the basic questions keep yeah, being I asked. I heard that for the first time. I said, yeah, that's smart. I'll do that too. Say <laughs> John cheese. Say cheese, John. One, two, three. Grown-ups spend a lifetime sorting out beliefs, coping with disappointment, adjusting to change. But what about the children? How shall they be taught to cope with illness in the house? I think one of the things that children feel uh, when a parent becomes ill is that they're going to be abandoned in some way, not only by that parent, but also by the parent who is, is well and that they have to be uh, uh, reassured uh, that they're going to be uh, taken care of and that they're loved. So it's important that the parent try to call in other relatives and friends to help in the household. Children are particularly prone to feel that the parent is ill because of something that they did that was wrong. 
And I think that they have to be reassured by the adults in the environment that they're not responsible uh, for the condition and the illness. People should anticipate problems in the family and prepare the children uh, for them. I was going to talk today about my mother's dying of cancer, as you may recall. Well, now, remember I, last week I said my poor mother? It sort of surprised me that I said that, because I didn't think I felt that sorry for her. But I guess I do. So, I must identify with her to some degree. I mean, what do you feel, John? You know, I felt very guilty about her, yeah. I didn't give her enough time, and I, didn't, I wasn't kind enough to her when she was sick. I found it very hard to have her dying at home, and a burden. I can remember one time just saying, I can't bear it any longer, I wish she would die. And then feeling very guilty about it. Guilt works both ways. Parents feel guilty when their children become sick, especially if the illness has a hereditary component. It's clear that parents may feel guilty if their child comes down with diabetes, if there's a history of diabetes in the family. Uh, in black families, uh, the parents might feel very guilty uh, that the children develop sickle cell anemia, which is a hereditary uh, disease. Uh, in fact, uh, they, they have to wonder uh, at times whether they should have taken the risk to have the children. Uh, if the doctors explained to him that there was a one out of four chance that uh, you would have a child with, with sickle cell disease. And that's a difficult decision to make, and I think it, it requires uh, counseling uh, both before the birth of a child and counseling after the birth of a child. The ch child turns out to have a hereditary disorder to, to minimize uh, uh, the guilt feelings and, and tension in the family. Families do more than cope with illness. They sometimes grow closer, but only when they accept the sickness as a reality, a reality like any other, and work from there. Acceptance is a change of attitude. It's a change from that to an attitude of cooperating, cooperating not only with the doctors and the health care people in the hospital, cooperating with family, being open to people's outreach and to people's love, knowing that this was not something you visited on them, the patient, as retribution or punishment, accepting it as part of life. And when people do come to that kind of acceptance, healing can often take place so much more readily. So I would say that acceptance really is a change of attitude, and if we can help people to see this, we're helping in very profound ways. Okay.